you. Uh, let me screen share and call up my own presentation. I hope this is excellent. So be, before I discuss the central topic of my presentation, I'd like to indulge a short preamble by way of highlighting a few of the issues that scholars confront when approaching the study of Christian building design in China. The study of Sino-Christian architecture is actually a relatively new topic in the academic enterprise, first of all, because it concerns, at least in part, Christian religious history, which has largely occupied the margins of China studies in general. Among the reasons that I'm interested in the study of Sino-Christian architecture is that literally the largest material objects in China that speak to the long history of Sino-Western exchange are the missionary buildings that continue to punctuate China's rural and urban landscape. Now, among the most animated reactions that Western missionaries had when they first encountered China were, to be frank, uh, when they attempted to eat with chopsticks, and also when they attempted to understand the aesthetic principles that informed China's architectural sensibilities. Now, I've read through countless letters and notebooks by missionaries in China, and sketches of Chinese temples, pavilions, and stele are ubiquitous. The Dutch monk whose legacy is suspended above us uh, as we convene for this uh, symposium, Adelbert Grezhnik, is no exception to those who produced architectural drawings while presumably mastering the craft of eating with sticks rather than fork and knife. So before I speak about how Jesuits left their architectural marks on China's city streets and countryside, I'd like to begin more generally with the vicissitudes of Sino-Western exchange through the Qing era. Now, much of the early history of this exchange occurred in the rarefied precincts of, of the imperial palaces and gardens in Beijing. And the Qianlong Emperor was among the great progenitors of what we might call the impulse toward a China-West hybridization. After Qianlong's defeat of the Zhongars in what is today Xinjiang, much in the news lately, the emperor commissioned a series of 16 copper plate engravings to be produced depicting the Qing conquest of that area. The drawings were completed in the Qing court in 1765 and sent to Paris for engraving. 10 years later, in 1775, the finished French engravings were presented to Qianlong along with the plates. These engravings represent cultural hybridization at a high level. They were commissioned by a Manchu emperor to depict the defeat of Turkish people, won by a largely Chinese military, and artistically rendered in a manif manifestly French style. As Mark Elliott describes the images, they feature, quote, a distorted perspective based on Western techniques that are narrated by dividing the image up into two or three sections separated by greenery or mountains in a way they are like Chinese scrolls, close quote. So the subject style and material of these engravings represents a Qing era impulse to combine Western and East Asian aesthetic sensibilities. And to conjure now um, the topic of Western Jesuits in China, one only has to mention the richly Sino-Western painting uh, of Giuseppe Castiglione to invoke an image of Sino-Western hybridity. One of the most famous images of Qianlong is Castiglione's monumental painting of the emperor on horseback. No emperor in Chinese history had ever before been painted on horseback in this way. But in this painting, which is around 10 feet tall, by the way, the Italian Jesuit renders the Manchu emperor in a mode common of European portrayals of monarchs, such as Philip II of Spain, mounted triumphantly on their horses. Already by the time that Castiglione was in China during the 17th and 18th centuries, one sees the Jesuit interest in uniting Western and Chinese artistic sensibilities. While Qianlong was commissioning artworks inspired by Western techniques, 
Castiglione was meanwhile busy producing paintings inspired by Chinese techniques. I'll transition somewhat gradually into the next era of Jesuit artistic creation in China, the era that follows the Jesuit return to the Qing Empire in 1842. This second era of Jesuit activity in China was one less interested in what we presently call the quote, Sino-Christian hybrid than in the almost wholesale fabrication of a Gothicized China, one inspired by the 19th century fashions of the Gothic revival movement. Even before the eccentric ideas of Augustus Pugin and John Ruskin had begun to shape the architectural minds of many missionary builders, ideas that elevated Gothic above all other options for church design. China's Roman Catholic missionaries had already distinguished Western styles as the preeminent choice for churches. When the Franciscan friar Giovanni de Montecorvino was given permission to erect a church in the Yuan capital city of Canbalik in 1305, he constructed a grand Romanesque church next to the palace of the Mongol ruler. The Chinese architectural historian Zhang Fuhe has noted that Monte Corvino actually built two churches in Kanbalik, now called Beijing, one in 1299 and another in 1305, both in a Western style. The fact that, that Monte Corvino designed uh, China's first Western style structure is so well known in the Catholic community that popular depictions of him represent the Italian missionary holding a miniature church in his left arm. The Vatican archives preserve an informative letter by Monte Corvino dated to February of 1306, wherein he discusses his newly built Romanesque building, quote, for a more useful and suitable place for a Catholic church could not be had in the whole empire of the Lord Khan. And by the assistance and help of our benefactors up to the feast of St. Francis, it was finished with a wall all around the house's simple offices and an oratory, which will hold up to 200 people, close quote. Not only were Monte Corvino's two churches the first examples, well known examples, of Western architecture in China, but the Mongol Khan was said to have delighted in the Gregorian chant that emanated from the Romanesque cathedral beside his palace during the traditional hours of the divine office. By the early 18th century, it was Jesuit rather than Franciscan churches that surfaced from the cityscape beside the Forbidden City. The first version of what is known today as Beijing's Beitang or North Church was built in 1701, not 1703 as one sees in, in many sources. On property given to two French Jesuits who had used quinine to cure the Kangxi Emperor of Malaria in 1693. Now, I recently photographed the drawing of this Jesuit church at Oxford while reading through a folio of materials compiled by Beijing's Jesuit missionaries in 1701. This rendering represents the earliest known representation of a Catholic church in Beijing. And it tells us how the Jesuits chose to design their ambitious church complex. It stood in a decidedly European style that conformed to what they were accustomed to in counter-Reformation Rome. The front gate and courtyard are among the few visual clues revealing that this Jesuit church was located in China's capital city. Though even the Chinese style front gate is crowned with European Baroque flourishes as seen on this slide. In 1701, the, the Beijing Jesuit church aesthetically quotes early drafts of what the Jesu was to become Italian Baroque. Jesuit preferences for the Baroque made their way to the Qing Empire and grew in proportion as the missionaries gained more funds to expand their ecclesial presence in Beijing. In 1969, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France discovered and acquired a Chinese painting of the 1713 expansion of the Beitang, which shows a vibrant detail uh, 
what, what this of what this Jesuit church looked like before it was later closed. One sees in this version that the main Chinese that the main Chinese aesthetic aspects of the architecture appear on the roofs. So after the conclusion of the first opium war in 1842, French missionaries, especially the Lazarists, took abrupt advantage of the empire's laws that permitted foreign missionaries to establish new missions within the Great Wall. So actually in my mind, it was during the mid to late 19th century when the empire began to see Gothic first begin to rise precipitously above China's more horizontally oriented architectural affinities. Suddenly, Chinese villages began to witness a surreal aesthetic juxtaposition. It was as if small French hamlets with their hierarchically dominant Gothic spires were being transposed onto the Chinese countryside except that the diminished buildings were all traditional Qing era homes, temples, and government yamens, rather than what one expects to see in areas around Strasbourg or Chartres. Catholic churches and their affiliated buildings surfaced all over China. And there were several architects and missionary builders who designed them and oversaw their construction. But two, French designers represent, I think, represent well the compulsions of those who were attached to the Gothic revival movement. The Flemish priest Alphonse de Morluz and the French bishop Alphonse Favier. These two Alphonses were a tour de force in the late 19th century church building agenda in Northern China. And their preferred style, their preferred style was definitively Gothic. Now, Professor Kumans, who just very elegantly spoke, has published much on the life uh, and work of de Morluz. He describes the training and instincts of de Morluz as, quote, ultramontane. And it is fair to say, I think, that that, uh, that that is among the many reasons that he became the quick friend and colleague of the Beijing Bishop Alphonse Favier. Both of these missionary architects valued not only the Pope's supreme authority over the Christian church, but also cherished the Gothic style's supreme authority over the architectural vestiges of any other architectural style. Favier's position as China's most influential bishop during the late 19th century empowered him to promote and commission Gothic churches throughout Northern China. Fabier's uh, Beijing Cathedral radiates his preference for French Gothic, while de Morluz's church at Xuanhua emanates his preference for Flemish Gothic. Actually, no matter how you slice it, Fabier and de Morluz left such a large Gothic imprint that when later missionary architects or missionary builders tried to replace it with new, a new Sino-Christian style, it was already too late to realize much of a change. Favier and de Morluz were both educated in the kilns of European classicism. And the architectural essays of such prominent writers as Vitruvius and Marc-Antoine Marc Loger were among the works commonly read by aspiring architects. Loger in particular predisposed the thinking of Alphonse Favier as he described the differences between Chinese and Western building design. In his essay sur l'architecture published in 1753, Loger expressed a principle of architecture that Favier zealous, zealously endorsed while designing and commissioning buildings in China. Loger wrote, quote, solidity is the first quality a building must have. Frequent reconstruction of a building is too expensive and too disturbing to allow neglect of any precaution capable of assuring the longest possible life." Close quote. Loger's insistence that buildings should be made of durable, long-lasting materials is expressed in an 1866 letter that Favier wrote after observing China's architectural preferences. 
He wrote that, quote, in Beijing, all of the houses are ruined barracks and the imperial palace looks like a huge cage made of wood and paper, close quote. In other words, not only did many missionaries prefer Western styles of architecture over Chinese designs, but they moreover disliked Chinese buildings for their impermanence and appearance of frailty. Favi's remarks were critical of China's architecture, and he was actually not alone in his opinions. So when we discuss missionary church design in China, the post-Opium War era brought to China such missionary architects as Favier and de Morlouz, who fervently believed that Christian design in China must be Western. In many, perhaps most uh, cases of establishing Christian churches during the first part of the Qing dynasty, that is before the era of Favier and de Morlouz, missionaries simply purchased extant Chinese buildings, and this is the same building, and then added a cross to the front facade to turn them into places of worship. So before the mid 19th century, this was a common practice. In these structures, there was no quote, Sino-Christian synthesis. These were actually Chinese built buildings refurbished, refurbished as churches. The Sino-Christian synthesis would come later. So let's finally uh, move to the topic, uh, the main topic of my remarks the Jesuit mission at Chirli that continued to expand through the final years of the Manchu Empire. Commonly called the Vicariate of Xianxian, the Propaganda Fide established the Jesuit mission in Southeast Chirli in 1856. And the construction of new churches, seminaries, libraries, hospitals, schools, a printing press, and even an observatory was underway as soon as funds were solicited. I'll note five examples of Jesuit churches in, the, in this mission area that emphasize how the vicariate became a mainstay of Gothic revival. One might ask what inspired the Jesuits to align their architectural preferences so adamantly with those of Alphonse Favier, who was at the same time continuing his own program of Sino-Gothic design just to their north. The answer is actually Alphonse Favier himself, who made a point of visiting his fellow French missionaries who were commissioning church construction throughout the empire. While the Lazarists and Jesuits preserved some of their old rivalries in China, their mutual reverence for Gothic was a uniting feature of their relationship. This is a great image of Favier visiting the Jesuits uh, in Jerli. Favier was a tenacious publicist of Gothic design as uniquely appropriate for Christian churches, and his Jesuit co-religionists were agree agreeable collaborators in disseminating, I think, this visual message. When the Jesuits were building their churches throughout Southeast Jirli, the predominance of architectural examples of missionary structures to their north were Gothic, but also with a smattering of Romanesque and Baroque churches. Favier's design of Beijing's Dongtang, or East Church, remains an example of non-Gothic missionary structures at that time. Chinese architectural historians describe this church actually as, quote, Romanesque revival. Well, other, others in the West uh, often describe the building's Second Empire Baroque qualities. One sees in Favier's Dongtang the physical massing endorsed by Marc-Antoine Loger. Because of its bulk, this church was among the more difficult Western buildings to destroy in 1900 when boxers and Qing troops besieged the facade. The mission at, uh, at Xianxian, uh, the largest in the vicariate, is a good example of how the Society of Jesus created Western enclaves that expressed a Sino-Gothic image of Catholic China. At Xianxian, a rather extensive Congress of Western style buildings was erected and the Gothic revival church built near the Jesuit cloister was the most dramatic structure in the city, thrusting its tall spire high above the city. At a short distance from the larger complex in Xianxian in the small village of Zhangjiazhuang was the zenith of the architectural assemblage of Western buildings. 
both the exterior and interior of this 1863 church emphasize the character of French Gothic revival. Repetition of the pointed arch, groin vaulting, and an elaborate Gothic style main altar surmounted by a typical Jesuit depiction of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Again, we see that when the Jesuits erected their churches in the Gothic style, the surrounding structures, even though they were ostensibly Western, nonetheless relied upon Chinese techniques and style for their roofs. A good example of a more simply built Gothic revival church in the Jesuit area of Southeast Jirli was in the small village of Hejian, located just north of Xianxian and Zhangjiazhuang. This church was largely destroyed during the Boxer Uprising, as you see in the photo on the right-hand side of the slide. In the few photographs that still exist, one can discern the distinctive Gothic vision expressed in the pointed arch arches and the Gothic portal below the bell tower. Other Jesuit churches in, in the southern part of the province represent the overall schema to engender a French Gothic consistency of style. The Kaijo church is another example of how their tall spires cast their shadow over diminished Chinese villages. And finally, the Gothic revival church at Daiming, how they pronounced it there, uh, you could pronounce it Daming, but Daiming is their local pronunciation, with the usual, so uh, the, the Gothic revival church at Daiming with the usual Chinese style roof on its accompanying structures was designed in 1881 by a French Jesuit to again underscore the Jesuit Sino-Gothic vision of China's Catholic presence. This church, like several others within the Jesuit mission era, area was destroyed by boxers in 1900 and replaced with another Gothic revival building. Actually, when you thumb through the society's photo collection of Jesuit churches in Jirli, one is struck by, struck by the visual message that to be Catholicized meant to be Gothicized. During the first decades of the 20th century, a great change occurred regarding how Catholic missionaries imagined church architecture. And actually, I suspect that the turning point away from the Gothic revival as the favorite style was after the destructions of the Boxer Uprising, when missionaries had the opportunity to re-envision what Christianity might look like in China. One of the Jirli Jesuits who sadly died during the most violent months of the Boxer conflicts was the polyglot missionary from the Alsatian winemaking town of Rosheim near Strasbourg with its very famous Catholic cathedral, Modest Andlauer. When Andlauer arrived in China in 1881, he kept careful notes and produced sketches of the Chinese architecture he passed by on his way to Jirli. While his drawings, I, I actually not even close, while his drawings do not approach the quality of those made by Grezhnik, one clearly discerns Andlauer's admiration for China's temples, private homes, and pagodas. Andlauer represents an early stage of Jesuit attention to traditional Chinese design. And his mission in Wuyi, one of the very few Jesuit churches in Jirli that was built in a Chinese style, even though Andlauer's small mission church was erected in a Chinese style, he appointed the interior with both Chinese and Western items. Despite the use of Chinese lanterns and other furnishings, the very center of the church, the high altar, was made in the Gothic style. So that while worshipers occupied a familiar space behind and beside them, they still faced a Western structure during mass. So to, to return to my point that the Boxer Uprising served as an architectural turning point for how Christian church design was envisioned uh, in China. By 1900, only a modicum of church buildings look like the one at Wuyi. As we've already seen, Gothic revival predominated at China's Catholic missions. By August of 1900, the month that the eight allied armies marched into Beijing, most of the immense Western architectural edifices that marked China's cities and countryside actually lay in ruin. 
Favier's Dongtang was little more than a partial facade and a pile of rubble. Jesuit missionaries such as Pierre Xavier Merton were dispatched to photograph the ruins of churches that were demolished during the summer months of 1900. Photographs made by Merton and others reveal the massive scale of the destruction. But after the Boxer Protocol was signed in 1901, the Qing court agreed to pay indemnities to help restore the diplomatic and religious missions that had been leveled during the Boxer Uprising. The Imperial Qing Treasury paid some, I think it's Professor Menegon would know best about, about some of these specifics, paid some 450 million tails of silver in this agreement. And soon afterward, new churches began to emerge from the debris. These new churches were typically larger than the previous ones since funds were provided not only by the court, but also from Europeans eager to supply the needed support to restore the Catholic missionary enterprise in China. Romanesque, Baroque, and many more Gothic churches were built, but a new player in the history of Christian architecture in China arrived in Hong Kong in 1922, already mentioned by Professor Kumans, Celso Benino Luigi Costantini, the son of an Italian builder. Costantini was an Italian ecclesiastic, quote, a man of Rome, as we say of certain Catholic bishops with high connections in the walls of Vatican City. Costantini trans transplanted popular ideas from the Vatican into China when he was made China's apostolic delegate there. Two popes of this era, Benedict XV and Pius XI, had both concluded that Catholic missions had been unfortunately encumbered with Western attitudes of European preeminence that had no place in the legitimate aims of the church. These two popes encouraged two principles that would largely reform the architectural instincts of church building. Localization, which promoted an indigenous clergy and hierarchy, and enculturation, which sought to express the liturgical, theological, and aesthetic impulses of Catholicism in local forms. Costantini became as much a missionary of fostering local art and architecture in China as he was a missionary of the beliefs and doctrines of Christianity. In, 1920, in a 1927 letter, Costantini referred to Western art and architecture in China as, quote, an error of style. Costantini argued that, quote, it is an artistic blunder to import into this country the Roman and Gothic styles of Europe. And Gothic churches in China are no more than artificial flowers, elements artistically lifeless, close quote. And he asserts that, quote, the Chinese, when in church, should feel themselves at home and not in an edifice of alien forms, close quote. So to resolve this error of style, Costantini recommended a new Sino-Christian architectural hybrid. He concludes his letter insisting that, quote, a new type of church can be formed that will at once be perfectly Christian and perfectly Chinese, close quote. Even his own residence in Beijing was to embody this principle, perhaps especially his own residence in Beijing. In order to engender this new vision of a Sino-Christian hybrid, Costantini enlisted the talents of Adelbert Grezhnik from the Belgian Abbé de Maretsu Le Pro who left his monastic community and entered China for the first time in 1925. Gresnik spent, as Professor Kumans mentioned, five years in China as Costantini's main collaborator. Though of the many proposed, proposed Sino-Christian works that he sketched, as Professor Kumans also mentioned, only four buildings were actually built. These four commissions uh, were important educational uh, uh, places. The vast school complex, you know, let me just pass this slide. The vast school complex of the disciples of the Lord at Xuanhua, a seminary at Kaifeng, a seminary at Hong Kong, and the campus of the Catholic University of Beijing, more, more commonly known as Furendashia. 
Among the writings left behind by Greznik, just, just brought into question by Professor Kumans, <laughs> I think gloriously, uh, there are two short essays published in the Bulletin of the Catholic University of Beijing. Uh, these were actually widely read and translated into um, uh, other languages, especially Chinese, actually. His 1928 essay was largely a response to the ideas of Bishop Celso Costantini and mostly expresses his sweeping admiration for traditional Chinese architecture. Gresnik suggests that Chinese building design, especially for temples, can be divided into three fundamental elements, quote, the base, the body, and the roof. He asserts that, quote, the roof is the culminating mo motive in Chinese architecture. He also insists that compared to the West, the base, quote, is a conspicuous part of the construction. Resnick's essays not only describe the techniques and aesthetic traits of Chinese architecture, but they also serve to corroborate Costantini's belief that Western architecture has no place among China's Christian buildings. After praising Chinese temples for their ability to, as he puts it, quote, produce in the soul a sense of restfulness and peace, close quote, Gresnik states that, quote, Western architecture does more violence to that mute language of the soul of China, close quote. Even more, he contends that Gothic architecture is a, quote, complete antithesis to Chinese sensibilities both Costantini and Gresnik represent a consolidated effort to delegitimize any attempts to design and build Christian architecture in China that is Western and Gothic is the most impassioned target of their objections. So I'd like to insert here a 21st century criticism of Costantini's creation of the term, quote, Sino-Christian hybrid. The very term Sino-Christian conjures a dichotomy that bifurcates Sino or Chinese and Christian, thus separating these two terms into a polarity consisting of two disjointed items. Costantini then adds the word, quote, hybrid to suggest that they can be coalesced into one admixture. He implies that there are two distinctive architectural, these are, that there are two distinctive architectural aesthetics that can rightly be combined into a hybrid, while insisting in his published writings that there is no place for Western architecture in China's ecclesial buildings. Well, what then is, quote, Christian architecture? There remains a rather misty ambiguity here that neither Costantini nor Kresnik addressed with clarity. Well, I'll now approach my conclusion. In an excellent study of Gresnik's design of the Holy Spirit Seminary in Hong Kong, Professor Kumans creates a contrast between so-called conservative missionaries who intractably prefer Western styles for Christian churches in China and progressive missionaries who encourage a more sinified Sino-Christian hybrid. Among the, the assertions when discussing the ideas of the conservative and progressive branches of the Catholic missionary enterprise in China is that, quote, conservative missionaries argued that Chinese Catholics refused to worship in churches looking like pagodas and found Western styles the best expression of the foreign character of Christianity, while progressive missionaries argued that Christ should feel at home in China and therefore should not live in foreign houses, close quote. In other words, the more conservative contingent of Catholic missionaries disagreed with Costantini on the basis that Chinese Christians themselves didn't actually like churches built in the so-called Sino-Christian hybrid. Chinese Christians themselves referred to the churches erected by foreign missionaries to look Chinese as a form of pagoda style more chinoiserie than authentically Chinese. Interestingly, a Professor Krumans also asks, and very wisely, quote, perhaps by the end, Gresnik's architecture was nothing more than modern chinoiserie 
made with reinforced concrete, close quote. Now, Chinese Christians have conveyed that they actually favor, Chinese Christians today, that they actually favor Gothic revival as the preferred style for church buildings in China. If it is indeed true that most Chinese Christians now prefer Gothic to the Sino-Christian hybrid recommended by Gresnik, then Costantini's ideas are overturned. Or are they? Let's look for a moment at what the pagoda style of Christian architecture in China actually looks like compared to the prevailing European imaginings of China that were most common in France. Emerging in the 17th century and popularized during the 18th century, the European chinoiserie movement became a trendy fashion specializing in the imitation of Chinese artistic traditions. A number of chinoiserie engravings were produced, uh, uh, were, were produced, that were produced were based on the Dutch traveler Johan Neuhoff, who lived in China during the mid 17th century. The pagoda was among the popular themes in these engravings, and thus the Western fixation on the Chinese pagoda was born. Perhaps the most famous chinoiserie pagoda is the so-called Great Pagoda, designed by Sir William Chambers and built in 1762. When the French sinologist Francoise Aubin noted that many Chinese did not like the pagoda style of Christian church architecture that emerged under the influence of Costantini and Gresnik, she knew that this version of Sino-Christian architecture was largely inspired by the chinoiserie images of pagodas that had been digested by European missionaries before entering China. Perhaps the example par excellence of the missionary pagoda style is the Cathedral of Guiyang, though this church was built in 1876, long before Costantini and Gresnik had arrived. So before Costantini began promoting the Sino-Christian hybrid, there had been chinoiserie style churches that were designed to look like Chinese style buildings. These have been disparaged, I suggest, more for their reimagination of the Chinese style than for their attempt to look Chinese. Even Costantini worried that if Western missionaries designed Chinese style churches, they would look more like chinoiserie than traditional temples, government buildings, and homes. Few Catholic missionary congregations embraced Costantini's promotion of the Sino-Christian aesthetic in China more than the Belgian Société des Auxiliaires de Mission, which emerged in 1930 under the influence of Frederick Leb. The Samists, as they are called, have preserved an extensive collection of images of Sino-Christian churches that were built during the 20th century. The cathedral at Angua in Hebei province is among the most celebrated churches in the Sino-Christian style. And the Samist collection includes a large number of photographs celebrating its sensitivity to indigenous designs. Built in 1928 for the Chinese Bishop uh, Sun De, De Zhen, this cathedral served as one of the centers of Costantini's ideas and also as a visual token of Gresnik's design agenda. Even the Episcopal Cathedra, the seat of the bishop for Bishop Sun, was designed and built to conform to Gresnik's vision and to refer to the Angua Cathedral design, to refer the Angua Cathedral design to my early remarks on the pagoda style, the gate was designed to emulate the pagoda motif employed in previous churches such as the Guiyang Cathedral. And even the altars used for mass were designed to follow the pagoda style that Costantini had argued would, quote, make Chinese Christians feel at home. So I'll end rather abruptly with a few provocations based on what I've said so far. Provocation, provocations that I expect or hope my colleagues will challenge, agree with, or nuance throughout the remainder of this symposium. I suggest that while Costantini and Gresnik may have expected that their vision of a Sino-Christian hybrid would gain popularity, what has actually happened uh, is the opposite of their expectations. Chinese Catholics have mostly preferred the Gothic revival. Now, to illustrate this, I'll return to the mission area of Jirli, now Hebei 
to conclude with some examples of what resulted from the Jesuit Sino-Gothic vision of China. Long before Costantini and Gresnik had written their treatises on the importance of building Christian churches in a Chinese style, many of the French Jesuits who had built Gothic structures in China had certainly visited the Gothic edifice in the northern suburb of Paris, designed and built in 1144 by Abbot Suger. Suger's Abbé Saint-Denis is traditionally known as the, traditionally known as the precursor of the Gothic style, which thrusts upward toward heaven and is designed to accommodate high stained glass windows that filter a panoply of prism light into the nave. A bronze inscription above the doors to Saint-Denis state, quote, the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submersion, close quote. In other words, the imagery conveyed by the Gothic style lifts the viewer toward higher things. Gothic is theology in stone and glass, a view of architecture that was so compelling that the Jesuits in China believed that it was manifestly connected with the religious message they disseminated. Gresnik insisted that this architecture of Suger was an imposition, a blemish upon the Chinese landscape. So what happened after Western missionaries were evicted from China during the 1950s, especially in what was formerly the Jesuit mission of Jirli? Well, Chinese Christians, as if echoing the vision of Abbot Suger, began to erect towering edifices in the Gothic style ignoring the essays and arguments of Costantini and Gresnik. The post-Gresnik Christian architecture of China returned to the pre-Gresnik architecture of Sino-Gothic rather than Sino-Christian design. In what was the Jesuit cathedral city of Xianxian, Chinese Catholics have rebuilt a new cathedral complex abounding in a 21st century vision of Chinese Gothic revival. I actually just, uh, I recently visited this church in 2019 and I spent some time there with the bishop. They are quite proud of this building because for them, it represents the small c Catholic or universal, universal nature of the church. Gothic to them is not only an attractive style, it is also a physical testament to what they call the multicultural nature of their religious beliefs. Both the exteriors and interiors, quite opposite of what Costantini expected, feels like home to these Chinese worshipers. What seems like a vestige of a colonial and imperialist past to some represents a bridge between cultures to these Chinese Christians. Now, let me just pause here. Truth be told, I rather like Sino-Christian architecture, but I'm not Chinese, and I'm, I'm not deciding what styles to use when building churches in China. Even small villages in southern Hebei, the former site of the Jesuit mission, have chosen to build their churches in the Gothic style. Most of the architectural historians I've spoken with about these new Chinese Gothic revival churches has, have observed that they are really a hybrid of Gothic and Chinese. Now, perhaps we can call these new buildings, though somewhat out of step with Gresnik's use of the term, a, quote, Sino-Christian hybrid. Some have described them as, quote, hyphenated. The issue of mixing Chinese and Western styles is a complex conundrum. It is, as, it is in my mind, as complex uh, as any effort to hyphenate, whether it is race, religion, art, or the temple of heaven. The Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer is famous for having said that, quote, architecture is invention. For some who disagree with Niemeyer, architecture is, quote, quotation. And for others, it is both the invention of something new and the quotation of what is old. Chinese intellectuals who think about the influences that the built environment have upon us often conjure the issue of cultural identity. That too is part of what interests me about Gresnik as a Dutch Benedictine designer of Chinese Christian buildings. What is the identity of his inventions and quotations? 
I'll end here with a quote from uh, Professor Nancy Steinhardt, who will be offering our keynote presentation at the end of this symposium. Quote, Chinese architecture was deeply influenced by the great belief systems so long interwoven with the history of Chinese civilization, close quote. The Chinese belief system, the Christian belief system settled into China around 635, just 500 years after Buddhism entered the Middle Kingdom. That means that Chinese, that means that Christian aesthetic sensibilities began to interact with China, China's long building traditions around 1,386 years ago. And so it is perhaps not a stretch to suggest that the so-called Sino-Christian hybrid was in play long before Costantini and Gresnik argued that Christian architecture in China should be, quote, more Chinese. Perhaps in some ways, the Gothic spires that shared space with the horizontal temples and upturned roofs already were and still are Chinese. Oh, and there. Um, so thanks everyone. And I will stop screen share and turn over uh, the virtual podium to Professor Joseph Lee at Pace University who will provide uh, a response. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, Professor Clark. Um, I think this is actually a wonderful, you know, presentation. Uh, I think you actually offer a very rich and also a very colorful illustration uh, of this, you know, long history of the Chinese uh, Catholic visions of a Sino-Gothic uh, architecture of China. Uh, I think your paper actually raised some, you know, very interesting methodological and also conceptual issue for historian. Uh, to study this hybrid uh, Sino-Christian building style since the late 19th century. Uh, so I think because of the time, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight maybe two major points, uh, you know, or two major lessons that I learned from your paper. Uh, one is about uh, the constructive tension, a constructive tension between two different forces that was actually at work. Uh, in shaping the history of the sacred architecture, you know, among the Chinese Catholic. Uh, I think within this, uh, I, I, I think under this, you know, constructive tension, uh, we see this, you know, strong desire and also impulse towards a Sino-European integration uh, during the High Qing period. Uh, I think when the Qing Empire really see itself as an inner Asia empire, there was a genuine effort by the Qing leaders to work with the Jesuit missionary to accommodate the Western and also the Chinese you know, architectural style. Uh, but this is actually a China initiate, a Beijing initiated integrative approach. Uh, and, it, and, and you just remind me of today's uh, conversation or discourse about you know, synthesization or today's discourse of uh, you know, preserving the Chinese, you know, architectural heritage. Uh, so the desire for integration, uh, you know, the, the effort came directly from the state. Uh, the second force was actually that of the civilization mission uh, that we learned about in the late Qing period, especially after the Opium War. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, many Protestant missionaries also share the same, you know, assumption as well. Uh, you know, after the Opium War, you know, all this, you know, Christian design in China ought to be European and Western rather than indigenous Chinese. Um, so I would say, you know, these, you know, uh, two forces were actually in conflict with one another. Uh, and we can actually see that in most of the archival materials. Uh, but nevertheless, I think, you know, for those, you know, religious uh, um, organizer and also for the religious leaders on the ground, uh, their ultimate objective is to use this uh, you know, religious architecture to achieve the goal of, you know, Christianization and also evangelization. Uh, so whatever direction we take, um, I think that sacred architecture and also its sacred function uh, cannot be, you know, separated, you know, they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it actually left behind this legacy of the constructive tension between these two forces. Um, now, the, the second point um, I really want to bring out is about the social meaning of those churches uh, from the late Qing uh, to the Republican and also to the 1950s as well. And here I just want to highlight, you know, some of the, um, you know, major uh, features of this, uh, you know, the, the debate over this long period. Um, 
I think if we take the perspective of the Chinese, you know, Christian survivors, especially during the right after the Boxer War, um, I think both the missionary and Chinese believers, you know, they were deeply traumatized uh, by the Boxer violence. Uh, so I guess, you know, suddenly when they see this, you know, huge amount of investments in restoring the infrastructure of the old Christendom in China, uh, that is actually a quick opportunity for them. Uh, to build something bigger and also to build something much more powerful and secure on the same side of destruction. So I guess, you know, even though the choice was actually made by the bishop, but I think the local community welcomed the choice uh, made by their religious you know, hierarchy. Um, and I guess, you know, for many of the Chinese Catholic faithful, uh, they also would like to use the architecture to make a powerful statement to the former boxer soldiers and also to the chain officials about you know, which deity was much more powerful and superior. Uh, so to them, I think the architecture also symbolized some kind of a, a desire for demonstrating their new power in a post-boxer China. Uh, so I think in this kind of you know, church collaboration project, we actually see a great deal of freedom uh, and also a great deal of opportunity for cross-cultural collaboration. Uh, between the missionary hierarchy uh, and also the local community as well. Now, the interesting thing is when we get into the 1920s, um, I think your case study actually expand our whole conversations about indigenization, uh, localization, uh, and, also, um, and, and also what does it mean to build an indigenous Chinese church? Uh, by the time when we get into the 1920s, you know, we understand there was a new period of revolutionary nationalism. Uh, the Qing dynasty was gone. So I guess, you know, for the local Catholics, they are actually, they have to learn how to live with a much more secular Republican nation state. And I think one signature campaign of this Republican government was the anti-superstitious movement. Uh, so I think for the local Catholic faithful, the challenge is, if they actually embrace um, this you know, Sino-Christian integrative approach and also make their parish look a little bit more like a Buddhist or Taoist temple, uh, I think that may not be that helpful uh, at the local level because uh, it would actually create lots of misunderstanding you know, with the local Republican official. And, and I think it would also confuse uh, the non-Christian neighbors about where is the boundary, you know, the boundary between the Catholic community and also their surrounding uh, environment as well. Uh, so I guess, you know, the different uh, function and also the different um, um, uh, mandate of the Chinese state, uh, it also shaped this, you know, church conversation about what type of architectural style should be implemented uh, within the Catholic world. Um, now, the last thing is uh, about what happened after the 1950s. I, I think you actually, uh, you know, bring out, you know, a, a, a very fascinating, you know, uh, interview with the bishop, you know, in Northern China at the end of your talk. Uh, I think the only thing I want to add is, um, I think when we look at this, you know, Gothic church, they also come with all this, you know, side institution, the seminary, the school, and also the medical facility, you know, uh, by the side. Uh, after 1950, uh, we actually see, you know, most of these, you know, institution were being uh, incorporated into the state-controlled patriotic institution. Uh, but nevertheless, I think this, you know, uh, revival of the Chinese, you know, Gothic, you know, church architecture, I wonder whether it was also a kind of counter-narrative or statement to the official discourse of, you know, foreign imperialism after 1949. Uh, because I think for the Catholic themselves, I think they also carry this untold story of church revival and also the church recovery after the boxes. Uh, so I guess that uh, church memory of what happened after the boxer war, it also gives a rich meaning uh, to this uh, surviving and also enduring church uh, building as well. Uh, they survived the Boxer War, they survived all these decades of uh, the revolutionary changes, but the Chinese Catholic are still there to worship their Tianzu. Uh, they're still there to buy Tianzu uh, within the same religious architecture. Uh, so I guess uh, while we are talking about, you know, the, the academic or the scholarly discourse about the architectural debate uh, among the Chinese and also among the European church, uh, you know, leaders, uh, but I think at the same time, um, 
once you know the European architects introduced this you know a building style to the Chinese uh, world, they began to lose uh, the copyrights, you know, the ownership of the copyrights. You know, it is just like the Bible translation. Uh, it actually fell uh, to the future generations of the Chinese Catholic who decide how they are going to reproduce and also reinvent that you know building style uh, on their soil. Uh, so I think you know, in the new context of the 21st century China, uh, I think the um, the Gothic you know church architecture it actually carry a stronger political and also sometimes social and also theological meaning as well. Um, so I would try to you know. Uh, so I think that is very much my overall comments. Uh, so hopefully you know uh, you will have more time for conversation with other panelists and also with other participants as well. Professor Lee, thank you for those extremely insightful remarks. Um, I'll just briefly respond and then I don't know if anyone else will have a question. Um, let me also say I notice uh, a number of dear friends and students and colleagues who have who have joined in. So welcome to all of all of all of my, my colleagues, friends and students. You 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 mentioned something that I that that I latched onto, Professor Lee, and that is um, you talk about this 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 tension between a kind of an attempt at integration, a Sino-Christian, and then and then this tension between this this new ideal, the la mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission that was expressed by people like Alphonse Favier, I think, in De Morlus also, uh, and others, and several others, and and but what you did that really caught me, and that is through historical periods, Sino-Western exchange, Sino-Western Sino-Western relationships are couched in different historical terms. And each historical era is providing a different explanation for the past. So for example, um, during the early Qing, you noted that, that it was largely a Chinese initiative. You know, the Qianlong Emperor, the Kangxi Emperor also, they're initiating a kind of Sino-Western exchange, but it's, it's really sort of engined on the, on the Chinese style. But then certainly by the Boxer Uprising, uh, you have a new emerging um, interpretation that, that, that identifies this architecture as imperialist, as colonialist. And then certainly by post-1949, 1950s, you have a very solid, this architecture represents a Western imperialist um, and, a, and a Western colonialist um, uh, agenda. Those transitions of how history is couched how history is framed is to me an, an extremely important point. The one um, that the one dim dimension that interests me at this moment is in this exchange, in this um, uh, this Zhongxi Wenhua Jiaoliu, in this Sino-Western exchange. What are mostly I'm mostly interested in? What is the Chinese side of that exchange? How is it changing through these historical moments? And, um, and then the last thing I, I want to underline that, that Professor Lee that you noted, and that was and something that I need to emphasize more in my own work, that is the post boxer uprising uh, construction of churches built upon built with these indemnities was in fact a very strong statement of victory by the on the side of the Western um, builders. Um, a very strong sense of architectural dominance. If I would I would call it triumphalism, in, in as much as that they had survived the Boxer Uprising, and uh, and 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 the West sort of viewed itself as not sort of did view itself as as the victor in that in that conflict, and thus the architecture was even more monumental to under underscore that dominance. Um, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for those remarks. Those are extremely helpful. Are there any questions? How are we uh, in the chat? Oh, let's. Amanda, would, would you call on people, for example, or shall I? Let's see. Let's see what what questions. If I, what's the best way to field the questions here? Are there any questions? You could just unmute. In fact. I'll ask a question. Thank you, Professor Wong. Towards the end, you rather provocatively suggested that we had Sino-Christian hybridity going on before this very intentional effort to go about it. And so do you mind just saying more about then, what do you think makes for the Sino part of the Sino-Christian in um, the, 
Gothic architecture. Would you locate that in the fact that it was approved and appreciated by the Chinese Catholics themselves? Um, or are there certain architectural elements that you think are already even there in this previous uh, chapter of, of hybridity? Thank you for that question. Well, uh, this is something that Professor Kumans has written about a bit in, in, in talking about the construction site as a location for the exchange of ideas. And uh, certainly in Alphonse Fabier's letters and, and letters of other French missionaries, they talk quite a lot about, in both good terms and, and, and negative terms, about the exchange of ideas that, that, that occurred on the construction sites. And this is something that the Society of Architectural Historians has also been interested in, the, the so-called the influence of the indigenous person, uh, as they're couching it now, uh, in, 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 in when Western style buildings or Eastern style buildings are built in the West or when, when this happens. I think that um, in my mind, a kind of Sino-Christian hybrid, if, you, if we wanna think that way, was happening even with Matteo Ricci when he's building in, in what was, the records that I've read, it's a clearly a Chinese style building, though when you walk inside, there are columns that are Western and the art is, is Western. But there is already a kind of architectural exchange, a sharing of ideas, a sharing of techniques that, that is happening as early as, as the, 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 the end of the Ming Dynasty. Also for me, in any case, when, when churches are built or when churches are, um, when, when the, the Christian community moves into an already built Chinese building, uh, then we start to see a kind of exchange too because the interior aesthetic is somewhat Western uh, and the, 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 the needs of a liturgical space for a Catholic liturgy are, are, um, are accommodated to inside. So you start to see things that aren't seen in other Chinese style buildings and certainly not in other, style, in other Chinese temples. So for me, in any case, uh, just in the exchange of liturgical, of religious use that happens in these spaces, you already, are, I think, are seeing a kind of hybridity. But more than anything, uh, even Alphonse Favier, when, in his letters, he writes, uh, curiously, he's accused of a lot of things. Um, but, but one of the things that when you read his letters, he really writes a lot about and how much he appreciates um, encouraging local Chinese builders to build uh, to actually build things like gargoyles and trifoil sections of windows that are Chinese, to use white um, Chinese marble, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, make the gargoyles like Ch Chinese dragons as opposed to the gargoyles that you see at Notre Dame in Paris. So for him, what made his churches important, especially the North Church, was that uh, there was a kind of freedom for the local Chinese builders to build what would, would for him look like a, a, if you stand away from the, the North Church Cathedral in Beijing, it's very clearly Gothic, but as one approaches it, the details are very Chinese. So for Favier and for people like Zhang Fuhe in Beijing today, these architectural historians, they celebrate uh, Beitong as being essentially Chinese. Whereas you, 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 you read Western writers will say it's essentially Western. So looking at Chinese documents, it's essentially Chinese because in the details, one sees Chinese um, motifs. So for me, that, that hybrid is happening. And I would almost say as early as the Nestorian era, the Church of the East, to use a better term, as early as that era, we start to see hybridity, even in the stele, using Buddhist and Taoist terms to express theological ideas. And as a theologian, Professor Wong, um, I would be interested to hear what, what you think about this, this hybridity of theological terms using uh, Buddhist ideas. So th that's a, a, a very quick way to answer that. Thank you. Any other questions? We just have a couple more minutes. Oh, in the chat. Oh, Professor Menegon, could you comment on the verticality of architecture in general in China today, the fascination for skyscrapers and height and its connection with modernity? How does this connect with the popularity of the verticality of Gothic style in China today? This is a fascinating question and I've thought so much about this because certainly as a, a Qing scholar, Professor Menegon, you know that there were sumptuary laws about height and um, walls, I mean, the Forbidden City walls had to be a certain height. And certainly as you, as you moved up hierarchically uh, uh, in architectural space, things were nicer or higher uh, when um, 
when you moved up hierarchically in in the state system in the in, in the Qing. So uh, a city wall of a lesser important city had to be shorter than a city wall in in for example in the capital. So there are these sumptuary laws. Um, one of the things that happened was a, a great deal of debate when these Gothic buildings were built and these spires were erected. The debates were that the churches were violating these sumptuary laws and that they were offensive because they were actually presuming a kind of dominance over the local structures. The interesting part of that debate was the missionary response was almost unanimously, but Buddhist pagodas as a religious structure are also high. So uh, verticality for the missionaries represented um, a kind of uh, religious privilege uh, so that in as much as Buddhists were allowed to build pagodas, then the Catholics should also be allowed to build spires. And that won the day uh, in some instances. Some instances, the local officials were, were very plaintive about that. When I think about the modern skyscraper uh, movement. I, my first time in China was in the 90s and there were no real skyscrapers. And I remember seeing cranes everywhere. And every time I returned to China, the skyscrapers uh, loomed um, higher and higher. Um, the, 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 the interchange between modernity as a skyscraper and Gothic church, which is preferred in China, that's a question I don't know that I'm prepared to answer because for the, the, the Chinese Christians I speak with in China, uh, when they speak of Gothic and the height of Gothic, they often use with me terms that reflect a kind of multiculturalism, uh, an expression of the universal nature of, of the Catholic Church, uh, an expression that it helps them to, as Professor Lee mentions, distinguish a Christian church from uh, a, a popular temple or a Buddhist church. Modern architecture is, is interesting in, in as much as I think the rest of the Christian world started to build modern architecture in the 1950s, especially, and certainly after the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church, everything wanted to be modern. Um, so I don't think for the Christian community in China, Christian architecture has largely, in mainland China, been equated with modernity. In Taiwan, yes, absolutely. Um, maybe in Hong Kong also, I think modernity has been an emphasis. Um, but that's another question I should explore. That's a very good question. It is now 9.30 and Professor Kumans is, is to speak in, oh, yes, Professor Steinhardt, please um, unmute and provide a, a comment and then we'll take a five minute break. Well, a two, a two second comment. Like many things in the two wonderful talks we've heard, they will come up on Wednesday and there, the pagoda definitely comes up. So in brief, like the church, the, the pagoda is a foreign import and it always has to be understood as a foreign import. And it's never a comfortable structure on the Chinese landscape, which builds horizontally, fundamental principle of China. Uh, to answer the question about modernism and skyscrapers, my quick answer is that we're not even looking at modern architecture, we're looking at contemporary architecture in China and that architectural is global contemporaryism. And what you see in China, you could see in the United States, in Europe, uh, in Japan, or anywhere in the world. And the architects who build it might be trained in China or might not be trained in China. Can I ask a, just a quick follow-up? Yes, sir. In Europe, for example, I'm, I'm Italian, skyscrapers actually are frowned upon. They are not really something that uh, most uh, historic cities want to have in their skyline. London maybe is an exception, Paris in certain parts. Uh, but in China, uh, there is really a rush to build a new skyline. And some of these also have some Chinese uh, uh, characters like the 101 tower in Taiwan and similar ones uh, in the mainland. Don't you think that there is some hybridity there and some Chineseness to the skyscraper? You don't agree? No, I don't. I mean, Philadelphia may be the unique city that is anti-skyscraper, but uh, people used to say 20 or 30 years ago about Japan that one would have to return to the same place every year because there'd be new replacement skyscrapers. This is, this is China at, beginning in the 1990s, its participation in global architecture, I, I think. And I, I, don't, I don't think, I just don't see the link with the pagoda. Uh, 
Um, I mean, some people might think that. I don't think that there actually is a link. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this, this already is rich. So uh, thank you so much. We will now take about a four or five minute uh, uh, break. Most of us need to grab more coffee, at least I do. Uh, so we will take a five minute break. We will come back and Professor Kumans will speak to us about Fruin University more on Gresnik. So thank you everyone. We'll return shortly. <laughs> 